Hello folks, a bit of a follow on from the microscopy section in the uh, video I think it was either earlier on or yesterday, I can't recall where we are So I've taken the decision that FE1 and FE2 which is in total a thousand litres of proof of concept at the primary fermentation stage uh, I've decided it's not going to meet the spec unfortunately so we're going to have to dump it but luckily enough we haven't put the dry hops in yet which is where the majority of the cost for this particular beer is if we don't include a day's labour and the electric to boil it uh, which is about 120 quid so in total we're probably going to lose uh, close to three or four hundred pound on ditching this batch but I think it's the right move um, it just won't finish. What's happened, we've narrowed it down. Um, I've harvested yeast from a couple of batches over here in these tanks. No problem there, that's perfectly nat natural to do. But what I've then gone and done is on tanks one and two, I've underpitched. Tank three, fortunately, the vacant, I had loads of the yeast left and I overpitched, if anything. So uh, we're looking good on tank three, that's clear. But uh, these two batches of proof of concept, I'm afraid I'm going to make it. There's just what's happened is you always tend to have some flora in the beers anyway. No brewery sterile. In fact, a sterile brewery can cause more problems than a sanitary brewery. So what you just do is you deal with and mitigate for the flora within your beer with hygienic practices and making sure that the pH of the beer is correct. And of course that you put the right amount of yeast in there so the yeast can colonise and create a hostile environment a little bit like Theresa May uh, for the um, for the other nasties that we don't want in there let's be honest they're not really nasties they're just uh, unwanted bacteria like lactobacillus um, so yeah they, they cause the beer to slightly sour and stall so we're going to get rid of it so instead of uh, just opening the pipe and watching it all go down the drain which is what's going to happen in a minute I thought we'd go up top and we'd have a look in the tank and I would set up the camera to peer in here and we'll time lapse it emptying see how long it takes so uh, let's flick over let's flick over to that Well, we emptied that tank in a hyperlapse and it only gave me two seconds of video. So we're going to go across to this tank because there are two tanks to get rid of. And hopefully this one I'll just, just set it on a normal, uh, normal record and speed it up in post if I have to.
So that's the beer gone down the drain. But fear not, folks, we are brewing another batch. Oh my goodness. So yes, two batches at the end of the week to compensate for the ones that unfortunately we have had to dispose of. You can see the tanks are now, this one's disconnected. I need to disconnect this one and clean all the O-rings and everything. And what I also like to do is leave this off so the CO2 can fall out of the tank. For those who don't know, the CO2 will uh, destroy your cleaning chemicals if you use caustic. So you need that out of the tank before you start cleaning them. And then on a bit of a side note, we've been doing a little bit of a findings test with Browsol P, the um, Isinglass alternative, the vegan friendly findings. So uh, we, can, we can see here these three samples of uh, best bitter, uh, 20 millilitres per hectolitre, 30 millilitres per hectolitre, and 40 millilitres per hectolitre of Browsol P, respectively. And I think the 30 has it. There's the 20, there's the 30, and there's the 40. Now, we're looking for clarity, reduced suspended solids, and a compact sediment bed at the bottom. And these two have that for sure. But this one, as you can see, the sediment bed, well, I'm getting a bit close there. The sediment bed actually broke away and it started floating on the surface. It's actually a quite compact sediment, to be fair, but yeah, if it can break away, then not so much. Uh, we'll see a few bubbles on here as well, because I've got these sat on top of the HLT, which is warm at the minute. So, of course, it's kicked off a little bit of fermentation in there again as well, which is one of the reasons why that's let go. But it just shows you how compact the sediment bed actually is, because the the more fluffy one would be easier to separate and rise, which is obviously what's happened there. Anyway, Abigail, <laughs> we've just been to uh, Boys, which is a local craft stroke hardware clothing shop, bit of a jack of all trades, really. And we picked up some material because we're looking to go to a theme park on Tuesday. This one's the best. And you have to wear a mask. Of course, so we're going to make our own masks. So, <laughs> Abigail's brought a load of decorations, elastic, and some cloth material down there, cotton actually. And we're going to stitch up some masks this evening with uh, with the sewing machine, aren't we? Have someone? You're going to teach me how to use it, aren't you? <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, let's carry on with the brew day. Ninety degrees. We're almost at a boil, so we're a couple of hours away from home time. So moving forwards in a attempt to try and prevent losing a batch of beer to an underpitch, uh, which may have also had a contributing factor of lack of oxidation. Because I use dry yeast, I don't often oxidise. In fact, I never really oxidise. So today, we're going to start filling the tank via the spray ball to oxidize the beer as it goes in hopefully giving enough oxygen so that if we do decide to repitch any harvested yeast there'll be enough oxygen within the beer itself so that the yeast can replicate because I know they need O2 to form glucogens I believe in their cell wall so the oxygen's essential in that respect uh, so this is a this is a move to combat any future um, any future infections or or massive disposals. <laughs> Don't want to see that happen again. But I'm going to shut the lid because I can see a fly buzzing around. God, imagine if he got in there, I'd cry. <laughs> 